Hello, my name is Mark Litwin. I'm the head of urology at UCLA and an expert in testicular cancer, and I'm gonna spend the next half hour or so talking to you about the fundamentals of testicular cancer, what you need to know and what your loved ones need to know in order to be diagnosed early and to get treated and cured if testicular cancer were to enter your lifetime. Testicular cancer is extraordinarily common and is extraordinarily curable. And the most important thing to remember is that a cancer such as that of the testicle, when caught early, can be completely cured, but it matters where you go for treatment and it matters that you get diagnosed early and that you get treated early. There's a lot of information on the internet about testicular cancer. Some of it's good, most of it's bad. And so I would caution you that if you're looking up information about testicular or any other cancer on the internet, to be cautious about the, the source of that information. A very uh, reliable source is the American Cancer Society, the National Cancer Institute, and of course academic institutions such as UCLA. And for urology information, UCLA Urology has a terrific website with a lot of information on many different cancers. But on to the topic for today. A bit first about the background or the what we call epidemiology of testicular cancer. What you're seeing here in this picture is a graph uh, that on the bottom axis has the age of different individuals and all, along the side it has the rate of testicular cancers. And what you see here over all the years that this has been evaluated dating back into the early parts of the 20th century is that there's a spike of testicular cancer diagnosis. And it doesn't occur when you might think a cancer occurs, such as in older patients. That's more common with other cancers such as prostate, lung, uh, ovarian, cervical, colon, etc. But with testicular cancer, the spike in diagnosis comes in young men, men at the beginning of their lives, before even the prime of their lives, if you will. And so the most common age of diagnosis for testicular cancer is men between the ages of 18 and 40. And that's where you see this spike here. And it hasn't changed throughout all the years that they've been keeping statistics. And so it's particularly important for young men, 17, 18, 20, 24, 30, et cetera, to be aware of this disease and to be examining themselves so that the diagnosis can be made early if a tumor does occur. So here are a few of the fundamentals of testicular cancer that I'll run through in the, in the next few slides. And then after about 15 minutes or so, we'll stop and we'll have time to take uh, questions. <clears throat> so first, the fundamentals of testicular cancer. Uh, apart from what I mentioned, which is that most men are diagnosed by self-examination, um, is what you see on this slide. Undescended testicle, if you have a history of that, that increases the risk of subsequently developing testicular cancer by 15-fold. Some studies say 25-fold. Whichever you believe, it's a higher risk. And so if you have a history of having had what they call cryptorchidism or undescended testicle when you were a kid, that increases the risk of testicular cancer developing when you grow up and you become an adult. And for that reason, we advise parents of little boys who have undescended testicle fixed to be very, very attentive to examining themselves when they go through puberty and as they get on into early adulthood. Even if the undescended testicle has been surgically repaired and brought down into the scrotum where it belongs, that increased risk persists. And it's for the testicle that was undescended and the other normal testicle. The increase in risk goes for both of those testicles. We think it's because of something genetic that predisposes to an undescended testicle and that also predisposes to subsequent development of testicular cancer. So that's very important. A Couple of other fundamentals that are really key for patients diagnosed with testicular cancer. We are fortunate in that we have what we call markers or blood tests or serum tests um, to help us track testicular cancer. They help us diagnose it and they help us track it over time. Now, blood markers for cancers, testicular or otherwise, we don't generally do on healthy people in the population. But once we have suspicion of a testicular cancer, these are the tumor markers, the blood tests that we measure, AFP, HCG, and LDH. That stands for alpha fetoprotein, human chorionic gonadotropin. You see why we abbreviate these in medicine because the words are long. And then lactate dehydrogenase. And these are blood tests that are elevated 
in many, many cases of testicular cancer. Not all, but many cases. And it's really fundamental that the blood test be measured prior to removing the tumor. Prior to removing the tumor. That way we know if the primary tumor, when it was still in place, secreted these three markers, and thus those markers will be good over the long term to help follow an individual patient to see if he's ever going to have a reoccurrence of the tumor. So these blood tests are really critical. The other piece that's critical that's very helpful in diagnosing and helping us figure out how to manage men with testicular cancer is the scans that we do. Everyone with a new diagnosis of testicular cancer gets an abdominal pelvic CT scan. Everyone gets a chest x-ray, and then some people in addition also end up needing to have a chest CT scan, chest CT, and even a brain MRI. So the more advanced we think the tumor is, the more of these tests we tend to order. But in general, we start after the blood test with a series of straightforward scans, which include the abdominal pelvic CT scan, a simple outpatient test, and then a plain chest x-ray. And we kind of go from there. So those are really critical factors. Now, on to another factor that's also very important, and this has to do with how we diagnose these different types of testicular tumors. Not all of them are created equal. They all have very good prognosis, although some are slightly better than others, but we stratify them or divide them up into different subgroups, and that tells us how the tumor is going to behave, and it also tells us, we believe, a lot about the aggressiveness of the tumor, and then in turn, how we're gonna go about treating the patient for this, for this tumor. And we divide these tumors of the testicle into two basic groups, seminomas, and in a creative stroke of genius, the other one called non-seminomas. So we have seminomas and non-seminomas. And then the non-seminomas are divided up into several subtypes as well, as you see listed on the slide. Embryonal carcinomas, teratocarcinomas, something called yolk sac tumors, and then choriocarcinomas. There's some other minor variants, but these are the principal ones that we see in virtually every patient diagnosed with a testicular cancer. Seminomas tend to occur in slightly older men, that is guys in their 30s, whereas the non-seminomas tend to occur in slightly younger men, that is guys in their 20s. But they can crisscross and you can have either seminoma or non-seminoma diagnosed in any man of any age, um, and particularly in this group that we're most concerned about between ages 18 and 40. And so the way that we make a, a call as to whether it's a seminoma or a non-seminoma is based on looking at the tumor under the microscope in a pathology lab. So this is not something that an x-ray can tell us. This is not something that we, put, that we put a needle in to biopsy it. That's a big no-no with this tumor. But once the tumor is out, which means an operation called orchiectomy, we send it off to the pathology department, and our pathologists look at it carefully under the microscope and tell us, is it seminoma? or is it a non-seminoma, or is it some mixture of both? And that in turn helps us decide how to advise patients on what to do next. <clears throat> when we take out a tumor of the testicle and we subsequently get all these scans that I've mentioned, we then classify tumors into a basic set of one of three groups, stage A, stage B, or stage C. And this is similar for a lot of different types of cancers, but it's particularly important in men with testicular cancer. Stage A, means the tumor is confined to the testis, the testicle. Stage B means that it has spread, but it's only spread to the lymph nodes of the region. Usually that's, that's the lymph nodes of the abdomen, which the CT scan is looking at. And then stage C is if it's spread distantly throughout the body, such as to the liver, the lungs, the brain, and other organs. <clears throat> this, of course, is the most serious. This is the type that Lance Armstrong had and was completely cured of. And so I always use him as kind of a mental guide to advise patients and their parents often who come in to remind them that even in the worst case scenarios, people come back and live very, very productive and effective lives. But we divide them up into stage A, stage B, and stage C. One of the nuances of diagnosing and managing patients with testicular cancer is how we kind of stratify them out as to who has lymph node spread and who doesn't, and who we think has lymph node spread and who we think doesn't. So let me walk you through this slide. It's very important when we teach this to medical students and urology residents and fellows learning how to care for men with testicular cancer. But for every 100 men who have a stage A tumor, and you remember from the last slide, a stage A is where we think it's confined to the testicle. 
and not spread anywhere else throughout the body. For every 100 men who we think have a stage A, about 70 of them, in fact, have a stage A. They have no metastasis, no spread of the cancer. But, and here's the really big but, here's the big caveat, about a third of men who we think have a stage A, in fact, have a stage B. In fact, they have spread to the lymph nodes, and the lymph nodes just didn't show up on the CT scan. CT scans are terrific, but they're not perfect. And so for that reason, it drives therapy. For that reason, even though we think we've diagnosed a stage A tumor, we tend to treat patients as though they might have lymph node spread anyway because of that 30% who actually have metastasis. And of that 30% who actually have metastasis or spread to the lymph nodes, about half of them have what we call B1, which is a little bit of lymph, no lymph nodes, and about half of them have what we call B2 or B3, which is a lot of lymph nodes. And so because of that risk, we tend to be very aggressive and very hands-on in treating patients with testicular cancer for a variety of reasons. One, it's a very curable tumor. Two, it's a tumor that when treated adequately can be completely cured. And three, it affects men really at the beginning of their lives. And so urologists and oncologists are particularly um, taken with making sure that these men get the correct treatment. <clears throat> The way that we choose treatment is based also on stratifying. You hear me coming back to this, this concept a lot, and we do this in oncology. We stratify different tumors through different types of uh, variables, different types of categories. And one of the ways that we stratify testicular tumors is based on whether it's a low-risk tumor, an intermediate-risk tumor, or a poor-risk tumor. And so we classify them, as you see on this slide, good, intermediate, and poor risk. What you want to have is a good-risk tumor. What you don't want to have is a poor risk tumor. Fortunately, the vast majority of testicular tumors are what we call good risk tumors and not the intermediate or poor risk. But we need to stratify them based on where the tumor started. Was it in the testicle itself or was it in tissue adjacent to the testicle? And what the CT scan shows, and again, I'm coming back to the same theme, what the blood markers showed, all fundamentals of testicular cancer management. So I'm going to walk through a couple of the stages of testicular cancer. This is sort of testicular cancer level two um, to, to give you my perspective on what the evidence shows we should do for men with testicular cancer of different stages. So stage A, non-seminoma. This is one of the most common forms of uh, testicular cancer. We take out the tumor in an orchiectomy, which is an operation to remove the testicle, and then we do the scans and the markers, and we see if we think it's spread. The scans and markers come back clear, so we think it's a stage A, but we know there's 30% who actually have a stage B. And because of that, we offer patients one of these three options. Option one is called retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, which is the medical term for taking out those lymph nodes. Option two is what we call upfront chemotherapy, which means usually two or three cycles of a chemotherapy regimen the one we most often use is called BEP, bleomycin, etoposide, and platinum. The specific names aren't as important as, as the letters. That's how oncologists refer to chemo agents, by their letters usually. Um, or sometimes we use a, a regimen called EP, which is just etoposide and platinum alone, and drop the B. Um, but chemotherapy, regardless of what flavor you have, chemotherapy is another option. And then a, then a third option, which you see I've strategically drawn a line through so as not to be at all unclear about my own feelings about this option, but the third option is what we call active surveillance. Active surveillance is basically a guess that statistically the guy with stage A is 70% chance of being a true stage A, and only a 30% chance of being a stage B, and therefore we're gonna go with that and we're gonna guess that it's probably a stage A, and in fact he doesn't need any more treatment and we're just gonna watch him closely, active surveillance. So there are many protocols for active surveillance, and many of them are published on the internet, there's a lot of evidence for many of them, but the big caveat that you'll get from most academic urology centers, certainly this one at UCLA, is that this is very, very tricky business, doing surveillance, because it's a very strict regimen, and I'm going to show you in a second what, what it involves. A lot of blood tests, a lot of CAT scans, a lot of x-rays over the next two to four to five years, and the risk of having all those blood tests is pretty low, but the risk of having all those scans, we think now, is not necessarily so low. And really, for me, the big risk is that when I put a 20-year-old on active surveillance, I worry. 
that he's not going to be able to come back for all five years of the very, very strict follow-up because 20-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 22-year-olds in general tend to be distracted with other issues going on in their life and they don't really want to think about this. And so I worry about losing them to, to this active surveillance protocol. But this is a complete list of what we offer to patients who have stage A non-seminoma. Stage A seminoma, which has a slightly better prognosis, you see these uh, three options. These patients who have their testicle removed, it comes back pure seminoma, the scans and markers are all clear, we call them a stage A, but we know that there's a 30% chance that they're a stage B. We offer them either XRT, which is radiation, X-ray therapy is our abbreviation, either radiation to those lymph nodes or a single dose of carbo, which is a type of chemotherapy, or you, hear, you see here, I haven't drawn a line through it, I've just put a question mark at the end because I still worry about surveillance in this group, uh, but the, the prognosis of this tumor is so much better than the non-seminomas that many uh, urologists and oncologists are willing to entertain meticulous active surveillance as a possibility, but I always put the question mark there because it really takes a commitment. The onus has to be on the patient himself and his family to make sure that he comes back for all the various scans that do need to be done. So these are, this is what we do for stage A tumors. Why surveillance is risky, and then I'll move on, is as you see here. Uh, for these stage A tumors, you see here a guideline that's published by the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, the NCCN. You can go to their website, nccn.org, and you can look at all this and look at all the papers and the evidence. But what you see over there on the right, which is where you should focus, is that's what the scans and markers and exams uh, 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 have to be uh, ordered with a frequency of in order to be uh, adherent to these, to these uh, surveillance guideline protocols. So in year one, there is one to two months between every chest x-ray. That means a chest x-ray every one to two months for the first year. A CT scan every three to four months for the first year. In year two, it's a chest x-ray every two months and a CT scan every four to six months. In year three, it's a chest x-ray and bloods every three months and a CT scan every six to 12, meaning once or twice in the, in the year. And then you can read on here in year five and then in year six on um, to usually year seven or eight is how long we follow patients. That's a lot of CT scans. I can't do the math in my head, but I can tell you right now, that's a lot of CT scans. Um, and we worry about doing all those scans over time, and we worry about the possibility that patients will kind of fall off the wagon and not come back for all the scans that, that we think that they need to make sure that they don't end up with a recurrence. So this is kind of my emphasis slide, my punctuation as to why I think that surveillance is risky, because we worry that patients won't show up for all the surveillance. But if one is going to do it, this is the protocol that we, that we ask people to do. Um, the retroperitoneal lymph node dissection, which I mentioned earlier, which we do for many patients who have non-seminoma, um, is a removal of lymph nodes from the retroperitoneum. And let me explain the medical terms a little bit. In the abdominal cavity, what some people call the stomach, but what we more correctly call the abdomen, um, is located all the organs of the abdomen. And I've peeled away some of them. I'm not showing you here the pancreas or the liver or the stomach itself or the colon. What I'm showing you here in this picture is all the stuff that lives behind the peritoneal sac. So in the abdomen you have a sac called the peritoneum in which live the liver, the bowels, the pancreas, the spleen. And behind that, the retroperitoneum is all these structures. And what you see here, the big one running down the center is the blue, which is the inferior vena cava. It's the main vein of the body. And then over to the other side there, you see a little less clearly the aorta, and you see where it splits into the, the two main arteries that go down toward the legs. And then you also see the two kidneys that are shaped like, well, kidneys. And then you see on top of each kidney is something called the adrenal gland. All this lives in the retroperitoneal space. And then you see here the ureters. The ureters are the tubes that carry urine down to the bladder, which is down here but all sprinkled in betwixt and between these structures, and you see it drawn like little yellow splotches there, are the lymph nodes. And those are the retroperitoneal lymph nodes, hence the term retroperitoneal lymph node dissection. Those are the lymph nodes where these testicular cancers spread to if they're gonna spread. Those are the lymph nodes that we radiate in some patients. Those are the lymph nodes that we remove in some patients during a dissection. And we remove lymph nodes we take a, what we call a template. 
And so if it's a testicular, testicular tumor that started on the patient's right side over toward me, we take lymph nodes in that area that's boxed out. And if it's a tumor on the left side, it's slightly different. But those are the lymph nodes that we take. Now, people can live perfectly fine without those retroperitoneal lymph nodes, but we need to, di to diagnose those uh, nodes and find out if there's a cancer, uh, if the cancer has spread there, and that's why we diagnose them. That's why we take them out. <clears throat> so that's stage A. Let's go on to stage B, and then we'll wrap up. Stage B means we know that there's cancer that's spread to those lymph nodes. The scans weren't clear or the blood tests weren't clear, and we know for sure there's what we call bulky disease up in the lymph nodes. We see this a lot in patients. I had a patient in my office just yesterday with exactly this, and for patients with stage B seminomas, we give them either radiation or we give them chemo, and then over time we restage them. We repeat the scans, and in the vast majority of patients, the lymph nodes get better, they disappear, and they respond to the radiation or the chemo. I'm picking up speed here, as you can see. A, a stage B non-seminoma, which we also see very frequently, you see here. Um, <clears throat> what happens is we give the patient chemotherapy, then restage him, and after we restage him, we often will find a persistent mass in that area. And that mass can be nothing, what we call necrosis fibrosis. It can be something, persistent cancer, small chance, or it can be a benign tumor called teratoma. And that's about as much detail as, as a, an introductory lecture on testicular cancer goes into, but we watch these masses very, very carefully. Sometimes we give them more chemo, sometimes we actually go in and remove these masses if we think that there might be cancer harbored inside of them. Finally, stage C. Stage C, as I mentioned earlier, is when the cancer at the time of diagnosis has spread all throughout the body. Liver, lungs, brain, bone, all throughout the body. These cases also, it may surprise you to know, are often very curable. They are typically very curable. This is the Lance Armstrong tumor all throughout his body, and he was completely cured of it. These tumors are always treated with chemotherapy. BEP, remember these letters, bleomycin, etoposide, platinum. Then there's salvage chemotherapy if that doesn't work. There's salvage, salvage chemotherapy if that doesn't work. But between all those different approaches, it's almost unanimous that we can cure these patients. Not 100% but almost 100% of these patients can be cured. We give them the chemotherapy, and then we subsequently restage them again, going back to my original slide, CT scans and markers. This is the, the crux of how we follow patients over time. I'll finish with a couple of sort of minor points. This is just for those who are, who are particularly medically minded among the audience. This is what a, a tumor looks like. Uh, that has uh, spread all the way up to the lymph nodes. And you think back to that chart that I showed you earlier, the little cartoony uh, view. This is a real, actual patient. If you look in here, you can see his liver up here. You see little pieces of his ribs. Um, you see his vena cava over here, the aorta I mentioned over here. This is bowels up here, a little bit of spleen over here, bladder down here. And what you see right here, the thing you can't really miss, the thing that my two 12-year-old twins could see from across the room, is that's his advanced tumor. And you can see it on the cross-sectional image, which is kind of like a bread loaf over here, the two kidneys in the back, the white, which is the spinal bones, and then that large tumor right there. And that is very, very frequently, frequently what we see when someone doesn't come in early. And then after the operation is done and we remove all this, uh, we end up, again, this slide is not for the faint of heart, I apologize. Um, this is before the tumor has been removed, and this, you can see, is the live view of that, vena, of that vena cava. The aorta is back inside there. You can't quite see it. This white string is around a vein going to the kidney here, and this large thing here with a couple of little clips marking it, that's the tumor. Fast forward about six hours, and what we end up with is what you see on the other side here where you see the vena cava and the the vessels to the kidneys. Now you do see the aorta coming up just to the right. Um, and then you also see an artery running off to the kidney. And this is a patient who has been cured. It's six hours of long, hard work, but he's curable and he's cured. He comes back the next year and the next year and the next year and the next year and the next year. And that's what keeps us going in urologic oncology because these patients are so, are so curable. That's it for the really tough uh, medical pictures. I'll just finish with, uh, with this. Um, there are a number of controversies in testicular cancer. One of them surrounds this issue of what's called microlithiasis. 
micro meaning small, and litho meaning stones, small stones. This is an ultrasound. The entire view is taken up by a picture of a testicle. And you kind of get the sense that it's an oblong shaped structure. You have to look at a lot of these to really make sense out of them. But what you can see very clearly from across the room, and I presume even on, on the internet now, is that th this testicle is sprinkled with lots of little white dots. Microlithiasis, these are miniature stones that have formed inside the testicle. There's a lot of evidence that these are associated with cancer. There's a lot of evidence that they're not associated with cancer, and no one really knows the right answer. But a lot of men who end up getting an ultrasound for some testicular complaint, not a lump, not a mass, not a tumor, just some testicular pain, swelling, some random complaint, patients will get an ultrasound, and the ultrasound will come back, no sign of tumor, but we see microlithiasis. It worries patients a lot. And I'm telling you right now, it's not something that we, that we tell patients to worry about. We follow them, we keep an eye on it, but the vast majority of patients with microlithiasis don't end up having anything that is cancerous. So that's the 25-minute version of what I know and what I think is important to know about testicular cancer. I'm Mark Litwin. I'm the head of urology here at UCLA, and uh, I'm uh, available to take questions uh, now. I'm going to need someone to hand me that because I, my eyes aren't quite good enough to read way down there. Questions about testicular cancer. <clears throat> Can you give me information on testicular self-examination? Great question. Um, I started by saying that one of the ways you benefit, one of the ways you, you decrease the chances of becoming impacted by this is by doing testicular self-examination. You know, we do a great job of teaching women and girls to do breast self-examination. We're not so good about teaching boys and young men to do testicular self-examination. But it turns out it's super easy. Generally what we tell people to do is that when you're in the shower, in a private place, and you're able to, to be, your testicles are, are lower down because of the warmth of the water of the shower, and you're all soaked up, you just take two uh, hands and feel the testicles very carefully. You take the tips of your fingers and pass each testicle back and forth from your left hand to your right hand, using your fingertips to palpate or examine or feel the surface of each testicle. And what you should feel in a normal testicle is the main globe of the testicle, the main body of the testicle, kind of egg-shaped. And then adjacent to the testicle, there's lots of other stuff, tubes and blood vessels and nerves and muscles and fat tissue and whatnot. That we don't care about. Patients don't get testicular cancer of the other stuff. The cancers form in the testicles themselves. And so what a tumor feels like is a rock growing within the body of the testicle, not a pebble, but an actual stone, a rock. And it can begin to pop through the outer edges of the testicle, and that's where most young men will feel the, uh, the mass or the tumor itself, is that the testicle, the, tu the tumor has popped through the outer edges of the testicle, and you feel it, literally, uh, when you're examining yourself. You wouldn't see it, you might not notice a swelling, but to feel it, um, for a man to know the normal consistency in the nooks and crannies of his own body is really important because you get to know when there's something abnormal that develops. If I have testicular cancer, will I feel any pain? Great question also, and the typical answer is no. Testicular tumors are usually silent. Usually it's called what we call a painless mass. A, no symptoms but a mass that forms. So the majority of patients don't have symptoms. In fact, if you have a testicular complaint and it is associated with symptoms, it's good news. It probably is not a testicular cancer. Question number three. My brother had testicular cancer. Should I be checked? And the answer is yes. Testicular cancer does have a tendency to run in families. So if you have a father or a brother with testicular cancer history, your chances of it are increased, and it's a good idea either to get checked by a primary doctor or a urologist, or at the very least, to examine yourself fairly regularly. But we do routinely tell patients with a family history that self-examination and extra checkups are important. Next, what are the risk factors for testicular cancer? The main one, which we discussed before, is this history of undescended testicle. So if you have a history of undescended testicle, even if it's been fixed, usually when you were a little kid, you still have a risk of testicular cancer, so you got to check yourself. Other than that, there really aren't a lot of known risks for testicular cancer. Family history, as I mentioned, but that's about it. 
Next questions. What lifestyle changes should I make if I have testicular cancer? And the answer is that when you're diagnosed with a cancer of any kind, it's a window of opportunity to get your life in order in terms of all the aspects of your diet, your exercise, and your lifestyle choices. There are no particular dietary changes or lifestyle changes that we know of today that can actually improve prognosis or diagnosis in testicular cancer. But I can tell you that I often see young men in the office with testicular cancer who say, what can I eat to decrease the chances of this coming back or a progression? And my answer is, there's nothing that you can eat or not eat to help you with testicular cancer, but you wanna know what? You're 15 pounds overweight and you're only 30 and you should lose that weight because that's gonna come back and get you in a few years. So it's a window of opportunity for other reasons, for other health reasons, uh, but for the testicular cancer itself, there is no lifestyle change that we know of that actually makes a difference um, other than just living healthy and being healthy in, in general. <clears throat> Next question. Are there racial or genetic risk factors for testicular cancer? So we talked about the genetic risks. Patients who have a history of testicular cancer in their family, brothers in particular, but also fathers, are at somewhat higher risk. And there are also racial differences. White men are much more likely to be diagnosed with testicular cancer. Those of African ancestry, African-American men, it's extraordinarily rare. Prostate cancer is not true. Prostate cancer, the opposite is true. African-Americans have a higher risk of prostate cancer, but that's later in life, that's in the 60s and 70s. For testicular cancer, being African-American or being of mixed ancestry with part African-American uh, background, that actually is protective and that decreases the chances that you'll ever get testicular cancer. Not true for European-Americans or Caucasians, um, and so that's important to remember. Next, another very important question I get all the time, will I still be able to have kids if I've had testicular cancer? And the answer is yes. Testicular cancer necessarily means that you lose one of your testicles because it's got to be taken out, but the other testicle typically works just perfectly fine in order to create sperm to, to father a child um, down the line, either then or, or down the line. What we do know about men with testicular cancer is that their sperm counts are a little bit worse than men who've never had testicular cancer, and not just because they only have one testicle, but even the, the testicle itself produces sperm that aren't quite as good a quality, so they have a little bit more likelihood of having difficulty in fathering a child, but the vast majority of men who've had testicular cancer go on to father children, those who want to, um, without much, if any, difficulty at all. And so it's a very important question that young men often aren't thinking about, but which does come into, into play uh, during a situation like this. Next question, what causes testicular cancer? This is the question that everybody asks that there's really no great answer for. The why me question, did I do something? The answer to that is no. There's nothing that you do behaviorally to cause testicular cancer. But beyond that, we don't really know what causes it. It's probably genetic at some level, but we just don't understand the underlying reasons for testicular cancer. The reason that those with undescended testicles subsequently develop testicular cancer, we don't completely understand. We think it's genetic, but beyond that, we don't completely understand. How often should I be checking for testicular cancer? The general advice is once a month. And what I usually tell people to do is either pick the first day of the month, last day of the month, your birthday day of the month, something where you can help remember to check yourself once a month. And we tell women the same thing for breast self-examination, and it makes a difference during their, their cycle. But for men, any particular day during the month is fine, but just do it the same time every month so that you become familiar uh, with the nooks and crannies of your own body, as I mentioned before, and then you know if something is amiss. And so once a month is what we tell people. And we tell people to start at about age 17 or 18 when they're adults, and we tell them to continue until they hit age 40. Beyond age 40, the risk of testicular cancer goes down so much that we don't even bother people with self-examination. Next to the last question, are there sexual side effects of testicular cancer treatment? And the answer is yes and no, mostly no. There are no specific side effects of, uh, of most testicular cancer treatments in that the most important side effect that men would worry about is the risk of impotence or e erection difficulty. And there is no risk of erection difficulty with any treatment uh, that we give for testicular cancer. So one shouldn't worry about that. The one sexual side effect that some men do experience is that in some uh, patients, the lymph nodes that I had pictures of before are so close to the ejaculation nerves that if those lymph nodes are irritated with cancer or if they're treated in certain ways, 
the ejaculatory nerves can become affected. And so some men, a small percentage, uh, develop something called retrograde ejaculation, backwards ejaculation. So the sex drive is normal, the erections are normal, the ability to have sexual activity is normal, but at the moment of climax, the ejaculation goes retrograde into the bladder. It's not harmful, it doesn't feel any different to the individual, but it just doesn't come out like a normal ejaculation would come out. We call it firing blanks sometimes. Uh, last question, can STDs or sexually transmitted infections cause testicular cancer? And the answer to that is no, absolutely positively not. Sexually transmitted infections are a whole separate area, a whole separate issue. Um, I put a plug in now, like any urologist should, for using condoms 100% of the time when sexually active, but one of the risks is not testicular cancer. So these are the questions that I've received um, <clears throat> thus far. And for those coming in um, off the internet, uh, let me read those questions. One, are there any free men's screenings for testicular cancer because I don't have insurance? The answer is this is unfortunately a, uh, a tumor that has not uh, attracted a lot of attention from some of the organizations that do do free screenings. So there are not, to my knowledge, in many places, large-scale screenings like we do for prostate cancer and even for, for colon cancer and some others, for cervical cancer, uh, large-scale screening fairs. But there are many free health clinics uh, throughout the country, certainly throughout California, where patients can go to get checked for testicular cancer. And so as with anything else that you try to, to try to get help, help for, medical help for, if you're uninsured, there are safety net organizations around um, and, and you can get yourself to one of those if you think that you have a, a tumor. A county hospital, a city hospital, a public health clinic, um, and there's, there's always a physician around or a physician assistant, nurse practitioner, or a nurse who can do a st testicular exam and help determine if actually the patient has something to worry about or if he's the worried, the worried well. Um, next question off the internet is about clinical trials. Are there clinical trials for testicular cancer? And the answer to that is an is a absolutely positively uh, gold, uh, golden yes. Um, there are many clinical trials for testicular cancer. We run, run many of them at UCLA, and you'll find them at other academic medical centers uh, around, but there are many clinical trials for very, very advanced testicular cancer. The good news about testicular cancer is that we have a very good sense of how to treat it, and so we know what the algorithms are for managing patients with testicular cancer, and there's not a lot of un unanswered questions. But there are still some, and for those, there are clinical trials that are in, that are in place. Without any further questions, it's my uh, pleasure to conclude this uh, webinar on testicular cancer. Again, my name is Mark Litwin. I'm the head of urology here at UCLA and a, a specialist in testicular and other cancers. You can find us on the internet at, UC, at urology ucla.edu, or you can just do a search for UCLA Urology. You'll find this as well. Uh, information about testicular cancer, prostate, bladder, kidney cancer as well, and a number of other health issues that are related to urology. So I thank you very much for your time and for your registration, and remember to feel those testicles. <laughs>